Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks again, as always, for joining us here on The Avid Reader in our, oh, wow, 10th or 11th year. Today, our guest is Rika, well, I know, Rika Aoki. Uh, Rika hey, everyone. Hi. Um, Rika teaches English at Santa Monica College and Gender Studies at Antioch. Her previous work includes the poetry collection Seasonal Velocities, the novel Hey Mela Ahilo, uh, Hey Mele Ahilo, Why mm-hmm. Dust Shall Never Settle on This Soul, and her latest work is Light from an Uncommon from Uncommon Stars, Light from Uncommon Stars, which will be released next week by Tor. So, Light from Uncommon Stars is a book that is hard to describe in a brief introduction, and my introductions are never brief, but I've generally been doing fine with introductions for the past decade, and it's facile to repeat the old saw, you know, I read this book in one sitting, but I did, which was quite irritating to my partner since I didn't finish it, actually not sitting, but lying, and that was at 4 a.m. So, (laughs) so we travel with kids. We travel with Karina and Nguyen through a journey that is filled with more than I could tell you in half an hour. And I hate to do this in front of a poet, but her father, her mother, donuts and duck, trans and tron, aliens and violinists, warp drives, warp divas, souls, solos, hell and earth, on, hell and hell on earth, devils and details. Okay, enough of that. So we start <laughs> out on an Asian bus, which I have taken many times from New York City to Philly. Because it's, mm-hmm. it's basically it, free. It's and, basically free. <laughs> and, and as Katrina tells us, I've met Vietnamese, Korean, uh, Chinese folks on these trips and made semi-intelligible conversations with many. It's fun. So mm-hmm. on that bus and throughout the book, Katrina endures the comments, girl or boy, if girl, ugly uh, and worse. And I'll skip mm-hmm. ahead and, and then turn this over before, like I said, as off time happens, I end up doing the talking. So soon we meet Shizuka Satomi, Lan Tron. We sit in a donut shop. We visit aliens while we dine on any number of delicious dishes, which is why while reading, I went downstairs and made myself a cheese omelet because I got mm-hmm. hungry reading and cheese omelet was really easy to make and I drank some mango juice. Okay, that is enough by God. Welcome, Rika, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so very much, and good job with pronouncing everything. You got Himalaya Hilo on the second thing. Just one little thing. For some reason, my teaching gender studies at Antioch showed back up on my bio. I love Antioch, but at the moment, I'm not teaching there. So just, hi, Antioch people. Love you. Um, I wasn't sure. We'll meet up again soon. (laughs) If you look at Wikipedia, then your biography, you get all confused. I don't even look at my Wikipedia because I just don't look at it. It's it's a thing, but I'm, I'm glad people play with it. Continue. Oh, well, that's funny because we'll talk about the cover in a minute because it's kind of like a nomen for the entire novel. But Mm. epigraphs, you know, sometimes people go through Bartlett's or whatever and find an epigraph, but your epigraphs are your own. So when you Mm. Google them, it just comes up with your book. Mm -hmm. And so talk a little bit about your epigraphs, either off the cuff or if you want to read them. Well, I mean, this one here. Well, what happens sometimes is I like to have a good epigraph coming into a a lot of books, into books. This one actually, though, came out, you know, people think selling one soul for music is as simple as sign this contract and poof, you're a genius. Were it that easy, the world would be awash in transcendent song. Obviously, this is not so. Souls are cheap. The trick is finding the right soul. That was actually somewhere in, um, in the middle of the first chapter. And my editor and I, you know, we're looking for it because I really like epigraphs. I just, you know, they're, they're keynotes. And we chose that. So I got really quite lucky with that. I think as a poet, it really helps because I have a good, you know, it's like, um, I think I have, I shouldn't say I have, I think I have a good ear for line. And, you know, when something just has that right blend of telling you enough to turn the page, but not enough that you may think you don't have to. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's like, again, another old saw, but it doesn't have to mean, it just has to be. And mm-hmm. that's what I noticed about both of those. And, you know, trying to touch on to, trying to touch on a 
familiar trope about lost souls. You know what the book is about. Yeah, in, and yet, um, don't finish the thought. Well, yeah, because the first thing that comes into your mind is Faustian. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. and then that puts, sets you on your way. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll go back because I love epigraphs too, but owning a bookstore and an independent one. And thank you for doing that, by the way. Oh, it's, it honestly is my pleasure. Um, the thing about it is, okay, so I can't put them out there. There they are, but I can't put them out there until September 28th. Mm -hmm. And what you happens know, to you if that, if you do that, do you get sent to hell? <laughs> no, it's like, um, do not remove tag under penalty of law on. Yeah. So it's worse than hell. Okay. I get it. There's two kinds of people in the world, the kind that rip the tag off and the kind that don't. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I understand that. Um, I do a similar thing. I tell people there are two kinds of people, the people that leave the shopping cart where they are, where it is, and the people who put it back. I'm the kind that puts it back. And that's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, my father said there's always two kinds of people in the world. And I thought about that. It's pretty true. Mm, absolutely. Um, so yeah, the cover. So yeah, mm -hmm. what I was going to say, what I always say is people say you can't judge a book by its cover, but every single person who comes in here without exception judges the book by its cover and yours is really cool because as I said it has these coy in addition to this murmuration of stars and the thing about it is and you know I do my best not to do spoilers and you warn me if I'm getting close to it but like I said the koi are kind of this gnomon like this yes. sundial because they aren't you know they're beautiful but at the same time they do what you say they do you know, mm -hmm. and I really loved your choice of word for that. I hadn't thought of it that way, but absolutely. Uh, this when this cover first there's this book covers no pun intended. This book, speaking of the cover, this book covers so many different genres and oh, people and languages that if we try to be representative on the cover, it would be it's own mini comic and it would uh look horrible to be honest with you um it took me it, you know it took me 370 pages to make it all come get, come together so we had a a wonderful artist who came up with this this koi in space look and we don't even know if we're looking up or down. We don't look if the koi is in the stars or if we're looking down and it's the stars reflected in a pool. We don't know. And every character in this book has felt like this at some time or another. Ergo, the gnomon points to shadow and the shadow goes around the sundial. So um, that I, I just, uh, I'm really tickled by your saying that. No, uh, it just seemed yeah it just it's like again like a poem it just seemed to fit and that mm -hmm. it's a good that's a good word for a poem because it it's kind of like a portmanteau word mm -hmm. anyway i see this is what I do i end up talking anyway um yeah what you said about it could it could be different genres i mean i was thinking it could be just a book about katrina's journey it could be a sci-fi novel it could be a, a cookbook of sorts mm -hmm. it could be this faustian melodrama it could be a subtle love story It'd be a guide to eating and San eating noodles in the San Gabriel Valley. I mean, By the way, yeah. that is a real restaurant and it's quite good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So I'll let you tell about the book in a minute, but mm -hmm. tell that one inspiration that you had about the donut shop. Oh, well, um, I was coming back from, a, so this book really came, I, I thought about this whole set of characters when I was flying home from uh, Los Angeles, you know, flying back into LAX, Los Angeles International Airport from a reading. And uh, what can happen is if it comes, I don't know how, but if the plane sometimes approaches from a certain direction, it bangs. And then suddenly, if you're at night, you're just looking at all the lights of LA. And because your sense, because your sense of gravity is a little wonky because the plane just banked, for a split second, you don't know if you're looking up or down. And for all you know, you're ascending into this, this galaxy with these pulsing spaceways and everything. And um, because I'm just that way, I like to keep that image in my head as we land and think we've arrived in the stars. In any case, then um, I got my little Honda at the time and, you know, like my little, my little space runabout. 
And I was, ta- I took my car out of the parking lot and I was just driving and really trying to keep this idea of being a, a little astronaut in space driving home. And I saw lit up on La Cienica Boulevard, which you all can see, Randy's Donuts. Now, Randy's Donuts is one of those classic, you know, they talk about that goofy Los Angeles architecture. Well, this these giant plaster and chicken wire donuts are part of that. And Randy's has been preserved and they light it with these arc lights. So it's like brilliant and glowing. And I, I was driving by and there was a little line of people uh, getting their donuts at, at God knows what hour. And, and there it was. And I felt just so happy seeing it and I thought to myself what if that you know if I'm in a runabout what if that were a space station in fact what if that's a stargate and wouldn't it be great to shoot people through it and we'll just leave it there I love the idea of the replicator using up 16 percent of the energy (laughs) (laughs) It's just so absurd, but it was so, yeah, I guess it would. <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, you, you know, e equals MC squared, solve for M. That's a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it is. That's, and the tectonic plates, all this stuff. All right, okay, uh, let's Thank go back you. up. Let's go I'm back up. I'm quite proud of the tectonic plates, by the way. Well, talk about, yeah, energy, holy mackerel. I, I had to think of a way to get a lot of energy fast. And Southern California has earthquakes. So there. Especially when you're trying to beat the devil. That's you know, story. that's not a uh-huh. And we don't have Bob Ross. <laughs> <laughs> or Thomas Kincaid. Oh, golly gee. Yes. <laughs> Let's leave him alone. Okay. So why don't you, since we're trying to sell your book, why don't you tell us a little bit about the story? This this is how long it takes me to get. We've gone 16 minutes. And I haven't asked mm-hmm. what your book's about. Well, Light from Uncommon Stars uh, is about a cursed violinist, a beautiful violinist who uh, was cursed because uh, signed a contract with hell to sacrifice her soul and she back she backtracks out of it for many reasons and she for reasons that will be explained in the book is in a sort of limbo where hell can't legally take her but she's not legally free so they try to work it out where uh, just as in the Bible, you know, I shall be avenged sevenfold. She needs to find seven souls so that hell can save face and she can have her soul back. Uh, so they, she accepts this and they put her on a mission. And her job is to find, uh, because hell has good taste in music, she's obliged to find seven brilliant genius prodigy musicians who are for some reason only you know, on the brink of success, but have all felt like they're missing something. And trade you your soul for that missing piece. And so she does this for six times and now it's time for the seventh. And she's having some problems finding the seventh because she might be a cursed violinist, but she still is a violinist and she has her standards. Yeah. So and can, mm-hmm. and it's on. interesting because one of my favorite characters, not my favorite who I'll ask you who it is, but um, uh, Astrid, who's, uh-huh. real, she's Swiss, so she falls uh-huh. out your little group, but, um, yes. and she has to adjust her cooking um, yeah. because of that, but her cooking is great. And, yes. uh, and- Switzerland's uh, a great place. <laughs> yeah, and her, um, and the people who, the, the neighbors who are actually, they're Latin, the neighbors who are Latin, mm-hmm. uh, donate their bitter lemon, uh, bitter melons and things like and that. Tangerines, a lot of tangerines, more tangerines. If you've ever had a neighbor with a tangerine tree, there will always be more tangerines. Yes, pigs too, <laughs> pigs too, which are very helpful. Mm. For me. Pigs are the same thing, absolutely. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have, oh, you know, it's really funny because I was looking up derivations of the words like, you know, the tamiko, tamiko is Japanese. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's Kemp. As you, why don't you get a Jaguar instead of your Honda? Because then, because when she's driving and e- weaving in and out of the Lexus, she sees Koreans and Japanese people and Cambodians. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, and you know, the 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 Jaguar is actually 
a gift from one of her admirers, you know, from the past. And, you know, how she makes her money is, you know, people of high culture don't necessarily tell you where their money comes from. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, at the end, you know, you, you, you find out that um, Jessica has worked the system in more ways than one to attain her wealth. Yeah, and... And worked very well at it. And, it it's... Yeah, and people are, everyone is in awe of her when mm -hmm. she enters the room. It's, just, it's not only charisma, but there's an element of fear and awe. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, right now, I'm sitting in here, and even though, you know, we're talking like this, um, to a point, readers will be here, you're here, and there's, there, there's judging going on. Is this a book I want to buy? Is, is this a performance worth supporting? And a lot of the terror doesn't necessarily come from Shizuka, Shizuka herself. She really doesn't have to do that much. It's what she represents, the desire and, and, and the hunger and the hope and the fear. And it all gets mixed up into this, uh, into sort of this, um, you know, sort of conflagration of, uh, you know, just, you know, want. And to come at it from another angle and another aspect of the story, we're really talking, well, I can't say we're really talking about one person, but Katrina is as close, it's her journey. And so, if someone sees on the back of the cover the word trans, they're not gonna buy the book. Mm -hmm. You know, what, 20% maybe, 25% aren't gonna buy the book because they I've see- I've noticed, that. yeah. And I try to tell myself, you know, sometimes uh, that people will, will you know, but what, you know, what can you do about that, right? We, we write the stories that are in our hearts. No, there isn't anything you can do about it no. and you shouldn't do anything about it. But, I, but it's also, you know, you talk about the way that uh, she makes her money and mm -hmm. talking about her charisma and the fear that she induces and her deal and all that. Then Katrina has her own methods of making money too. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. go on. I was just going to say they're completely different. And yet they're resonant with each other. Yeah, I know. I was just going to say something like that, but I couldn't say it that way. Uh, the thing is, each of them is involved in selling a part of themselves and each of them is an outcast. Um, it's really ironic uh, what, you know, for example, with trans women in, 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 in the world that they are thought of as unacceptable. And yet the subgenre of transgender pornography is very lucrative. And so how can you not approve of somebody and yet be drawn to them? It's an interesting place, you know, uh, desire and propriety, when they meet, it becomes a very interesting dance. It's like, uh, and a really good way that you made that point in finality was when Tremont sets his little trap at the end with the competition, and then the organizer and glad hander of the competition, Mr. So, uh, mm -hmm. walks by Katrina and does mm -hmm. what he does. And then she says what she says, you know, sooner or later, every, everybody's, uh, you know. That was a really delicate, that was a yeah. really delicate thing to write because it's so easy to polarize this encounter. Someone's all good and someone's all evil, you know, or someone's a predator and someone's prey. That would have been a really easy way to, to go. And I think that one of the benefits of being a transgender writer writing a book about transgender people is um, I don't feel compelled, nor do I feel any reason to have to do the easy thing. If somebody calls me on it, I don't care. I'm as trans as you are. We're good, you know? Uh, so I can, I can, I think, uh, I, I can address a character who may be very transgender, but very in between black and white with a, with a sureness and, and a boldness that somebody who wants to write a trans character but isn't sure if they're entitled to it, they can't do. Yeah, and the funny thing about it is, and it was very well done by you, as you said, it was delicate, is that the reader, I'm mm -hmm. allowed to decide whether he's just going by to check on things, if he's going by because, or because, you know, you, it's only one line. It's mm -hmm. only one movement of one hand, which is the way life mm -hmm. is you know, turning a steering wheel or turning away from a sliding door, you know. You know, 
even to this day as it doesn't happen very often nowadays, but uh, there's still that chance where, you know, you're just kind of like walking down the street and or you're going to McDonald's or something and you're ordering food. And if somebody doesn't want to serve you, that ruins your entire day. And uh, with people who are trans and queer, this happens. Yeah, which is very hard for me. Or you go into a mall and nobody looks at you, which yeah. is something I talked about. Mm -hmm. Or if you're black and you just really can't even, you know, there's a joke about, do you want your receipt? Yeah, I want my receipt. Do you want your mm -hmm. receipt in the bag? No, I want it stapled to the outside of the bag. Mm -hmm. so that, you know, and, and that's the way it is. You just have to live that way. You have to. And, and I think that I don't know how it is for, for white men in this world. And I don't want to assume. That's the interesting thing. You know, it's like. Uh, I'm the classic old white yeah, man. You might as well ask but me. But, you know, the thing is. If you walk when you're when you are a person of color, when you're queer and when you are trans, it always feels like you're walking on ice at any time you can step somewhere wrong and suddenly uh, you've sunk a little bit. Uh, there's a scene in the, uh, you know, where a couple of the trans go out and they're just going to the bakery and they run into, you know, a bit of racism and people might wonder why is that there and my answer is why is racism right why is racism there at all and it always shows up sort of in, in a ram random place where there's these little almost like landmines that just show up in your life and i was wondering do you understand what you know is this is this a human thing well because i'm jewish and i grew up in a neighborhood in philadelphia that was my high school was 80% Jewish, so I was pretty much shot by everyone mm -hmm. Jewish. And then I became a lawyer and went to Florida and mm -hmm. got a job, but I didn't realize they didn't know I was Jewish, nor did I realize that it would make any difference. That it would make any difference, absolutely. And then they would start using terms that I would find pejorative. Um, even one time they used the word kike, which is the worst thing you can say to a Jew. Mm -hmm. yeah. I gave them enough room for them to hang themselves and then I told them, you know, I'm Jewish. And then they became incredibly apologetic and really, really nice to me. So uh -huh. it, worked, it worked out well. But, you know, when I moved there, there were places I couldn't move because of restrictive covenants that said no Jewish people can move in here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can really so, not, yeah, it's not so, the same thing. But, you know, so, you know, as it's important that we don't assume things about each other. Yeah, exactly. But good luck with that. Well, starts, you know, my feeling as well, I can't change the world, but I'm, I'm going to try not to. And in this novel, you know, I really tried to show that assumptions can lead people awry, like even somebody, you know, even one of the, you know, quote unquote, white people, Astrid, you know, um, Katrina is surprised that she's a very good musician at first. She thought that she was just part of the help. And for somebody to immediately make those assumptions, we have to understand that we can be misjudged, but it's very, very easy for us to turn around and do the same thing to somebody else. I and I really wanted to weave that into the story that we are both the cause and the solution. Well, if you go back to the story and you think about what, I, well, it's like you being a black belt, you know, no one mm -hmm. knows. You could tell me you're a black belt, but otherwise, no, as you sit there, no one knows that. Mm -hmm. But then how did you, I mean, there's so much expertise with regard to the violin in, in the book. And there's so much expertise with regard to cuisine of all types. And, mm -hmm. and there's so much knowledge with regard to space travel as well and energy. Um, where did you draw all this from? Or is, just, is it like me, you just read when you were a kid and just kept reading and reading and reading? For most of the things, I just kept reading and reading and reading. Remember, uh, you know, I'm assuming that, you know, we both grew up in a time without the internet, which meant that we had encyclopedias. Yeah. And we, you know, and, and just read and we read books and we read. And, and for me, uh, that I was already feeling like a bit of a misfit in this world, although at the time I didn't quite have the vocabulary. And books were a place that I could... I think as for so many people, books were a place uh, that I could find peace that would really just uh, offer me gentleness. 
I could even a rough book would never come out and hit me. It it was it was gentle. If I if I was if found something frightening, I could close the book. I was in control. And in in a life where I had so little under my control, uh, it was something that I just uh, fell in love with. And to this day, I'm in love with books and and what they offer. Books are books are like you know a dog without the excessive noise and the poop. They're always there. They're always glad to see you. They're always going to love you. Yeah, my dog is my dog is incredibly goofy and weird, but yeah, he does. I guess it's unconditional love. I, I just think he's yeah. just. And I think books also are one of the few. Th and, and the funny thing is books come from human beings and yet they offer unconditional love. So maybe that says something nice about us. Yeah, it's weird about books because, you know, I own an independent bookstore, but in researching for reading your book and researching for it, I use my iPad because I had a net galley. And mm -hmm. that's all I had. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot good about it. I mean, it can touch a word and I can find out what it means. I can find out how many times the word koi is used, mm -hmm. including your acknowledgements regarding the reggae rock band. Mm -hmm. you know, I never knew who they were and now I'm listening to them. Mm, yay. <laughs> and, uh, and it's hard to do that with a book, but every day people come in and say, I have to have a book. I can't use my Kindle. And I, it, it's as if they're holding, the, as if when I read that, I'm kind of, it sounds weird, but kind of holding you in my hand. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't know how long it'll last. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if 12 and 15 year old kids are gonna yeah. keep doing this. I don't know if it's not, I have no idea either, but you know, there's a, there's always going to be an occasion for um, a classic suit, a little, you know, a black dress, you know, and even if it becomes uh, something that we only do for occasion because, you know, our more functional uh, books and texts will be passed along through Kindle. Um, books are books. I, I really don't, I don't think we're ever going to lose our awe of what a book can do. So funny because of you, I, <laughs> I also had braised duck last night. I'm but so I glad. <laughs> I wouldn't have had it, but for you. And then I realized, you know, I, if it's not crispy on the outside, I can't really enjoy it. Mm, I agree. Really? Really. Yeah. Really. I like the, the crispy on the outside is, is it, it makes it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I adopted um, my ex-wife and I adopted two children from China. Part of the best mm -hmm. uh, part of the adoption process was duck ducks hanging in the window as they are in your book. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the Samu barbecue duck experience is, I know. is amazing. And I'm glad you like the duck. Yeah. And I think that everybody who, has no moral obligation to eating a bird, should go have duck because duck is a wonderful thing to eat. <laughs> except, except, uh, you know, it's funny how it's tran and, it's tran and tran or tran and mm -hmm. tran. Yeah, so that was really good and funny to a certain extent. But, but the fact that she sees the duck swimming and then can't correlate eat, seeing the duck swimming and then consuming the duck. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm her moral compass does not point in that direction exactly and it's kind of funny that it's her feeling this way because she's the one escaping a war she's the refugee but sometimes those those barriers and those boundaries we have in our life is what has kept us through horrible horrible times of course when the uh when we've survived trauma and we've survived uh very very terrible pasts the trick is how does one let go of what's no longer needed and fully embrace the fact that you know we're somewhere else yeah well most people don't know whether most people even are able to do that i mean mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a leap it's kind of a leap of faith and it also takes you know there's thing you have obstacles in your life that really aren't that bad but if you're scared of them you're never going to attempt to I remember, you know, people were talking about uh, some of the legendary food buffets in the Catskills, you know, where you could just fressen and fressen and fressen, you know, just like eat. And, you know, fressen is what you say with animals usually, you know, it's like, you know, we're just eating and eating and eating. And you realize the other place where everybody eats is a funeral. And, you know, it's joyful, it's beautiful, it's a celebration of life. And yet there's so much 
that had to have been gone through to have this moment. And so I think, you know, just seeing, seeing our scars in even our celebration you know, just is part of, I think, what makes good books, good music, great art. What were you doing in the Catskills? Oh, I never got really into it, into the Catskills, but I had wanted to go. I was engaged to an Orthodox uh, Jewish person for quite a few years. I can, I can, I read enough Hebrew to get through a Seder. I can keep a kosher oh. kitchen. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, so yeah. you know, I mean, you, you know, we used to have we used to have dishes where it was like you know meat, milk, uh, you know, parv and mine in case I ever needed shrimp. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. It's funny because we grew up eating bacon and pork chops, and I always said to my family, "Aren't we Jewish?" <laughs> yeah, milk, fleshek, treif, you know. Yeah. yeah, so. But I went to camp in the Catskills for like five years, uh -huh. and the thing about it is, when I first went to camp, I kind of liked cheese blintzes. But after every day, mm -hmm. for four summers, I will never have one again, ever. Oh, gosh, that's how I feel about chicken fried steaks. Uh, <laughs> when back in the day, we would be uh, when I was when I was writing more with the small presses, with zines and we were doing barnstorming, we would go from queer uh, queer center to queer center to this little bookstore to that little bookstore and we'd always celebrate and we'd end up eating way too much chicken fried steak and I really wouldn't be happy if I never had one again. <laughs> Did you ever go to Cracker Barrel? Yes, yes. <laughs> Cracker Barrel, you know, the funny thing about being in a crack, I mean, Cracker Barrel, you know, once we get past all of the, uh, you know, the difficult bits, um, Cracker Barrel is just just a hoot. It's a really interesting place, and and uh, yeah, it's if we could ever get past if you know if we could ever get to a place where cr Cracker Barrel was a little bit nicer to everybody, and the patrons were a little bit nicer, and and vice versa, it's a place everyone should go to. It was fun. Yeah, it was my mother's favorite place in the last two years of her life, as you would say. It's a real mitzvah that I went there with her every. Mm -hmm. Tuesday night, but that's where I was thinking about chicken fried steak. And also the store outside the restaurant is like, she loved it. It was like heaven mm -hmm. for One of the problems with this country is that so much stuff that could be good has gotten intertwined with a lot of, a lot of hatred, you know, a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, you know, it's not that uh, a place like Cracker Barrel or even Chick-fil-A is inherently evil. It's just if they could please get their heads out of their butts, you know, we could all enjoy it. But yeah, there it is. I know. Pardon and my language for getting head, but it's Chick-fil-A. I can say that. Get your head out of your butt, Chick-fil-A. Thank you. Yeah, plus Sundays would be a great day for them, you know. If oh, absolutely. A... But then, you know, you know, if if nobody kept any of the holidays, there'd be no reason for all the Jews to suddenly become Chinese on during the holidays. I don't know why we get off school on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. We're one tenth. We're one tenth of one percent of the world's population. I don't know why they close. Well, they're hugely big holidays, though. I mean, Yom Kippur yeah, but... is like is like a big deal. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, uh... <laughs> You're going, how the heck are we going to get to talking about the book? But, you know. Well, it is kind of like it. I mean, Lance. Exactly. Right? It's kind would, of like it. Mm -hmm. She would kind of like, um, that's the other thing. She would kind of like Cracker Barrel. She would dig Cracker Barrel. She would so like Cracker Barrel. I mean, look at her at Olive Garden. Could you imagine her at Cracker Barrel? So, I, you know, and, and that's the thing. I believe that, you know, if we just... If magically, racism and uh, queer and homophobia and, and you know, anti-Semitism uh, and a lot and all of this stuff could just be gunked away, this country is so full of magic. Yeah, well, go ahead and, and talk about Olive Garden. I mean, she's so happy and unbelieving that they can get as much salad. And it, your book is really funny too. As Thank you. As much salad as she wants and bread breadsticks. Um, uh -huh. And the thing, the other thing that's part of that scene is the love that's between the two of them. And, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, uh, you as a poet, have written in such a way that I can feel that. I couldn't tell you one word of that scene, 
that would mm -hmm. give me the impression that they were in love with one another. But it's there. It's there. And um, what I was, there's two things. First off, I'm really happy that I was trained as a poet. So I can look for key uh, images and the, the questions, everything. I, I did my best to use my poetry uh, to, to lay that scene out. Um, even to the point of the of the server coming through, that was really important to the entire process. Um, but also, it really is something how I even in our um, even in our Asian American communities right now, uh, one of my friends' uh, mothers, you know, who you wouldn't know for just kind of hangs out and makes makes food you know talking about you know she and her sisters rescuing each other from the pirates they were in thailand in a rubber camp and you know make in a rubber plantation and the pirates came and they hid everything and they ran and they did this they you know it's like tom cruise should be doing this in a movie because it would be that it, it's that level of of pardon my language bad assery and yet here they are living a very suburban life and it's they've, they've uh, sort of sequestered that part of their life away and have embraced this new to the point that yay Olive Garden. And, and also they've sacrificed so much for their family that they don't get out very much anymore. So here are these people who have like traveled across the ocean in a boat never leaving their neighborhood because they have kids and grandkids and nephews and nieces and they they love it but i wonder how many of them still wish to travel the sea maybe not so dangerously but how many of them still yearn to do more and that's what i try to bring into talon yeah and also analogically she and her kids are very nuclear if you will family each of the kids having different talents and, or no talents or some talents. <laughs> and, uh, and she's, and, and then in that one scene, shall we call you mom? You want to call us mother? Should we call you captain? Should we salute you? Those kinds of things. And there you, it, it's such a regular family. And that was extremely interesting that it's a regular family, but they're as unregular as, well, they're un, more unregular than anybody on the planet. Mm. And you know where I came up with that? Uh, I came up with that from classic space opera. We're looking at things like uh, we're looking at things like the Lensman. We're looking at Triplanetary. We're we're you know we're even looking beyond at comics. The the Mar the Captain Marvel family, you know, and all of these books where they were golly gee so wholesome, and they were in space. And yet, yes, Captain Mom, you know. And I wanted to bring that uh, that innocence and honesty to this book. It was very, very important when I'm blending genres, not to muddle the genres, but while I'm in, when I'm in Doc Smithland, I'm gonna be in Doc Smithland. When I'm doing some heavy gender queer stuff, I'm going to be doing that. It's not, uh, it's not so much a situation where one weakens the other. Uh, in order to write a book like this, there has to be, I think, some respect. In fact, not some, there has to be respect given to the different genres that go in well since we're talking about the family and this is kind of a hint for you but who is my favorite character hmm we're talking about family and who is your favorite character gosh auntie floresta yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was good that was a good <laughs> guess she's just I, so she's so nice and she's so cool and the, everything about her is just, and it's so, she's so ethnic, mm -hmm. and, and her name is not a Vietnamese name. No, you know, it's just who knows where she got it because he, I, I have like you know one of my we tell the story and one of my, you know my mother tells the story about uh, I don't know if she's a relative or she's a friend of a relative you know of a generation beyond that her name was literally Wanda because when she was asked. What would you, what's your name? And she had a Japanese name. She had to choose an English name. She didn't know. So she asked, I said, I wonder. And then I Wanda became Wanda. Wanda. <laughs> who, you know, who knows where you get our names from? And I think that's, that to me is part of the fun of being American. We all have these, for those of us who 
uh, immigrated, uh, you know, emigrated rather, you know, from God knows where and then coming here, uh, there are always these moments of just sheer derpiness that, you know, become part of our own family mythologies. Yeah, like when we came from Ellis Island and they changed our name coming over, it was just like, okay, that's our new name. That's but our new name. Yeah. Exactly. And welcome to America. Here's just, you know, you can, there you go, you know. Yeah, the thing about Aunt Floresta I like so much, well, there's so many things, but also sh the sense of humor in, in her, and she mm -hmm. reminded me of both of my aunts, and she was a very stabilizing influence as well. And right. Talk about, if you, I don't think this is a spoiler, but talk about how the donuts were, why they were the way they were. And this is, I mean, this is key in life too. And mm. you, made it, you made it as a key of life. Why something well, becomes something that, different than what you thought it well, would be. I'm gonna, you know, just with the first part of the book, which is not really a spoiler because we're in the front, uh, you know, the, the donuts, when you're coming into a new business or you're, you're coming in, you're, you're, buying into a new business, but that business already has an established clientele. You want to just, and you don't want to make waves. You just want to keep the tradition, but you're from another freaking part of the galaxy. What do you do? Um, so the, they decide to use replicators to make perfect copies of the donuts, which is a very logical and wise and very efficient and foolproof decision, except do we really want our donuts that way? And in the crew, uh, everybody has duties except a couple misfits. And uh, Floresta is somebody who, you know, Aunt Floresta is somebody who's not a computer genius. She's not, a, you know, she's not, um, you know, a field marshal, although she, you know, later on we find out she is pretty good with a sidearm. But, you know, she's really just auntie. And, you know, um, what do aunties do in every family? They're not your mother. They're not your father. But goodness, that dinner's not complete without, you know, her salad, you know? And, and that's what I wanted to bring. I wanted to bring that stabilizing, oh, we're seeing auntie again. It must be a holiday. Oh, she's made the challah bread, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I wanted to give that. Florist, auntie Floresta, Floresta was a very, very important part of this book. She was. And who else in the family was incredibly important? Uh, when we're talking about family, uh, you know, and, and holding the family together, that would be Edwin. Uh, the again, somebody who doesn't have a purpose. But in this, especially in the United States, sometimes we forget that the purpose of a family isn't that place to rest while you're going to work. You have this thing called a family life. And it's something that doesn't just give you rest, it gives you identity. And Edwin and Floresta Neither of them, I would, I would, I would not want either of them to plan a trip to, you know, to plan a road trip to St. Louis, let alone a trip across the galaxy. But you know what? I would, I wouldn't have them. Oh, you know, I would. A trip without them would be incomplete because they would be the ones making it a family outing. Yeah, and they do change things, and they do change things for the better. But the other one. Mm -hmm. and I would say person, um, is Shirley. Oh, yes. Shirley is somebody who, I don't want to spoil too, no, too don't, much don't about do Shirley. Don't do it. Uh, but um, Shirley is actually inspired by uh, one of the uh, characters in R.A. Lafferty's book, Reese of Space, uh, where, and, and it really is this idea of what makes a family. And Shirley was one of my favorite characters to write uh, because the whole idea of validity, fitting in, you don't really belong here, you're not really real, are things that trans people face every day. And I couldn't put that all on Katrina because Katrina had violin lessons. So I had to somehow spread the message around between different characters. Yeah, and there were so many, like, even though I've gone through a couple of them, there were so many ways that you weren't blatant. And again, I think that goes back to poetry. But 
the, the lesson is learned, and but you don't even, in retrospect, you're not even sure how you've learned the lesson. And she's a perfect example of that in the book. This is one of the, yeah, one of the things about Light from Uncommon Stars that I thought was really risky was what I was trying to do with, from, you know, with my narrative. Thank you for mentioning that. Some of this book is implied. There's a lot that I will make three right turns rather than the left because those three right turns will, will bring us past scenarios that you're going to need later on. That's how you form links anyway. Um, and I think that I was worried that people would read the book and just get confused because this isn't where I expect anything. Uh, well, that was never my point. You know, my point was to uh, put things that you might not expect just a little bit. And if you stay with me, I'll get you home. And so uh, people who read this book and have gotten something out of it to me are people who have been able to put away some of their prejudices and I'm so grateful to them so grateful to you yeah and you know what um it's funny because the reason I picked this book and you to interview is not because of the trans aspect but because of the space opera aspect because I'm so honored <laughs> well when we were kids that's what we read whether it was Robert Heinlein and Starship Troopers or Farnham Sleehold was another mm -hmm. family one um mm -hmm. Or Ray Bradbury or Bradbury. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm mm -hmm. I I mean I reread uh I re for me the end all is Doc Smith of Space Opera. I just love my E Doc Smith. I just love and just also the awkwardness that Smith had with human emotion was so charming. And I wanted to bring some of that awkwardness into Lon. You know, yeah, and this this is how a golden age uh, space opera captain would fall in love awkwardly. And the good thing about Lensman is you just could keep reading and reading and reading and reading and never stop. It, it just goes on and on. And that was that was something I didn't want to do because, you know, Doc Smith had no idea how to end, end, end a story. You know, there was always, there's always the bigger explosion ahead, you know, um, kind of like, you know, what we're doing with Star Wars right now, we're going to be doing the Death Galaxy anytime soon. But uh, the, but there's, there is this exuberance and this can-do attitude that I really wanted to bring, you know, even uh, towards the end that I don't want to get into, but, you know, where, you know, the children come through, you know, I mean, uh, what? Like but, lost in space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I loved those, I loved those shows. I, I loved not just the Star Trek things, not just Star Trek, I loved Disney. You know, I, I loved uh, Escape from Witch Mountain. I loved that stuff. I loved, uh, you know, not just... Uh, not just Star Trek, but I loved a voyage under the sea. You know, there, there are all of these, these archetypal gosh, gee stories, space opera that I wanted to uh, not just pay homage to. I wanted to see if I could do it because I love this stuff. And what, what writer doesn't want to write the things that she loved? It's funny, I wasn't going to mention Disney because I thought you'd get mad at me. No. But, <laughs> but she reminded me of um, Maleficent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a picture of Maleficent right there, if you might I, be noticing. I wasn't sure. And then I was uh -huh. thinking, oh, if I compare it to that, she's going to think I'm looking down at the book. But No. And the thing about Maleficent is Maleficent, unlike the evil queen, is actually insane you know not not <laughs> evil she's insane she's operating she's not like you and me she's something else and uh shizuka has that choice what do, which one which way does she want does she want that because in some way she is she's driven by urges and uh and motivations that we can't fathom and yet um this is not always a good way to go it's That's beautiful funny. It's funny because it's like what you were talking about, the awkwardness of some of uh, the Lensman stuff. It's like when you read Robert Heinlein, he just can't bring himself to do a sex scene because mm -hmm. 
maybe because he was such a nerd or a geek that he couldn't imagine closing the bedroom door and then the people still, you know, and then going into the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And there is that to a certain extent in your book because, and again, without getting- You noticed that because yeah. that was done incredibly intentionally. I know it was. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is because I'm also Japanese, it's also a very Asian way to do it. And yeah. so uh, I got the best of both worlds with that. I, I am so proud for myself when I, when I read that and when I look at it, I, that's one of the points in the book where I think, oh, girl, you got that one. You got that. You did, you did good there. You did good. It was great. And also when her daughter says, go, go, over, <laughs> go over to the table. And that part was so funny. Mm -hmm. but, like, you know. And again, I, what would, you know, a Heinlein-esque captain do that because they're derpy when it comes to sex. And, um, you know, and it's, and it's not just, you know, and the funny thing is people say it's not just sex, but it's love. It's the other way around with a lot of these writers. It's not just love, but it's sex too. Do you mind getting them together? And um, I wanted to really... Um, really sort of insert that into my work, make it weave it in. And uh, hopefully readers like you who know where these tropes came from, enjoy the enjoy the tribute and those who have not enjoy the magic because it's there's a magic that comes with this sort of writing. Yeah, and it's so again, it's so funny because when they're in the runabout, again, not spoiling it, and then <laughs> when she first, and at the very end, she only, she sees the plum coloring and perhaps the elbow. And it's yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, because I really, I wanted to pay that off at the end. I mean, I was just, you know, you ever have those things where, you know, it's just out there in the beginning. And then at the end, you realize, oh, she, the author, she never forgot that was there. And I, I wanted to let you know that it's my way of telling the readers, I was with you the entire time. That's a good point. You know, me, me as author, I was with you the entire time. And I was always looking out for you. You know, going back to the movies you like, it's like E.T., because I started, I've, I'm in the middle of reading it again, which I don't, you get a swelled head, but I'm reading it again. And, you know, it's like E.T., there never was a sequel. But I'm thinking, trying to stay away again from giving away too much. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, well, why don't we go to the other side of the, and see what's happening well, there. I'm in the middle, I'm writing the second book of a two book deal. If I ever get the third, I want to go into space. The second book is going to be a little, I don't want to talk too much about the second book, but I'm in the middle of it right now. And that's, that's also going to take place on this, this lovely planet. But I'm with Tor, okay? I'm with the number one science fiction press in, in, the, in the galaxy. And uh, I'm going to, if everything works well, and, and, and you know, Let's hope it does. And if I have the chance to write a third book, I, I'm, I, I'm going to put that book in space. And we're going to see what's out there, to quote Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> yeah, make it so. Make it so. <laughs> but it's, it's true. Tor is like ingenious. I, sometimes I just can't understand how they know that this is right for them, you know? I did I not so. expect Tor to take this book. In fact, I I had thought to myself, Rika, you've written a book about transgender, you know, violinists, violinists. You're gonna write about Bartok. There's there are Vietnamese space aliens, and you're, you know, what did you do to yourself in your career? How are you ever? ever going to sell this book this book has taken you how many years to write and and you've come up with so many iterations and you've done this what were you thinking the thing about it is but i loved the book there's so much stuff in it like you just mentioned bartok and the way in which bartok is almost a character mm -hmm. in the book well 
yeah, he, he almost is a character in the book. And it's mm -hmm. like, you can't do this. I'm not going to let you do this. I am going to do this. You know, and it's like, but she can't do it. And that you as the reader are drawn into that. Well, should she, shouldn't she? Can't she just stick to the anime? You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was beautiful. It's, uh, there is some beautiful anime music out there. But I really felt, I don't want to give too much at the end, but the, sometimes we fight not our battles, but we fight the battles of those we love. And sometimes that's reciprocated. Yeah, and yeah. that's why the Tremont, even though the bastard he is, he says something at the end about love. Mm -hmm. you know, he says that and, the, and I didn't want, it, and Tremont's a bastard, but Tremont, Tremont's demon, Tremont's a bastard, but Tremont's not the ultimate evil in this book. Well, you know, you can argue he plays by the rules. He kind of does, kind of. He's, he's kind of, but remember, he's lawful evil, even though I call him a demon. And I called him a demon on purpose to let people know that, please, you know, we're, we're doing something a little different here. But uh, he plays by the rules. But, um, you know, if it wasn't for human weaknesses and desire, he'd have no job. There's nothing he could do about it. Right. And actually, if uh, I can't say that. No. <laughs> Thank you. I can't say it. I can say about the toad, you know, because that mm -hmm. was interesting and also very funny because no matter who looked at him, there was this little bit of them that said, yeah, but he reminds me a little bit of a... Of a toad. And and it never, I never really go into it terribly much, you know, but I thought occasionally, it's like the tangerines. You just sort of, it's a motif that kind of, it's an image that goes through. I think I learned this from my poetry. You did, definitely. And the thing about it is you leave it to the reader because you don't know why he looks like one. And I'm thinking, well, let me see. A frog doesn't look like that, but a toad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A frog is slimy, a toad's not, and then his face, and then then I knew what it was. It's this. I find, I find myself in, whenever somebody is reading one of my books, I feel like I'm in partnership with them. I'm saying, I think we're going to give a good story together. We're going to tell a good story together. Uh, I In all of my work, I try to leave a little bit unsaid because... The reader, I don't believe readers want to be 100% passive. Uh, I, I don't really need to tell everybody everything. I think that uh, a lot of, if I say a nightmare, I think the nightmare that a reader has, her personal nightmare is much more intense than anything that I could give. So there are some times where I'll indicate and let the reader do the rest of the work. And then when we look back, we can say, what a great story we wrote together. That's a, one question I always ask, and it's like, especially writers who are writing their first or second novel, where I say, you know, when you're done, is this like your firstborn, and you don't, you really are afraid to let it out into the world, mm -hmm. and do you wonder what's going to happen to it, and who's going to, what they're going to think of it, and that kind of thing? I think that um, I'm also a martial arts instructor, and when my when a student goes to, you know, her, his or her first tournament, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, they're going to, they're going to perform or they're not going to perform. What gives me, what gives me comfort and joy is watching to see for the first time how they react. There's an, there's an excitement to that. The first time uh, they're, they're in trouble. The first time they, you know, the first time they lose a match, will they get up? You know, the first time they win a match, how are they going to react? And uh, it's nothing at that point that I can control. I can do a little bit of coaching, but it's not. But what really I can control and what I w was able to control was when we were practicing in all those weeks and months and even years of practicing, remember all the work we put in. So, you know, that's, that's what, uh, what I think about. And I look at this book, I remember all the work we put in. Now my job is done. Uh, I, I accept speaking with people like you and the readers. We're done. And all I can do now is be excited and hope. Know there's going to be some matches won, some matches lost. Let's hope you win more than you lose. I think you will because you worked really hard. And let's go from there. And you don't mind what I do with it? 
uh, you bought it. And my feeling is, I when I write this book, it's a gift. When you, it's when somebody buys this book, it becomes theirs, and they will bond with it in a way that I cannot. Uh, uh, you know, like your child will fall in love with somebody else who's not you, but they will love them in a different way, and you will always be the parent. The one thing we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. and I would say it's the elephant in the room, but it's not, is like, okay, you're trans, it's trans, the, the awards you win, a lot of the awards you win are based on the type of writing you're doing. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it's about at all. And that's mm -hmm. where, for me, like, and semi-jokingly, as an old white man, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around what you've been through, what Katrina's been through. And so it's really hard for me to do that. And I think the way, I think this was the best entree into it that someone like me could have because my preconceptions would not have been dissuaded if you were much more blunt about it. Um, and I could have been a lot more blunt. There, there yeah. are about, you know, there are about 40,000 words of this book that didn't make it in because I had to vent. You know, and that, but that's my diary, not your novel. Um, but what I wanted to show by not, by, by doing this, two things. The first thing is, this is why, uh, this is my plea to good bookstore owners like yourself to really demand uh, a more, you know, a variety of voices and readers, because we have a lot to offer uh, American literature literature, Anglophone literature, not simply trans literature, but I'd like to think that when you read this book, um, you've gained from it in ways that go beyond knowing more about trans people. I'd like to think that it's been something that has been a good read on a human level with you. And well, there's not, you know, yeah. and I can know, I knew from the first or second page when she packed her her bag, and I like when she gave her bag away. To, she she paid, and that was really nice. Oh, I'm so glad. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. But on but, the first page, when she mentioned the two drugs that she's taking, the two, you know, the drug, uh -huh. and I didn't know what they were, so mm -hmm. I opened them up, and then I found out what they were, and that made mm -hmm. a difference. Mm -hmm. And you know, we all have our we all have our medications that make us who we are. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that was the first thing that I really wanted to show with this book and, and with most of my work that there should be every time we open up the, you know, we open up our bookshelves to, to writers who might not share our, um, our background. It's not about, hey, look, I'm diverse. It's actually something that can benefit you on a very selfish level. Your, your, your world gets bigger, you expand. And uh, so I wanted to write a book that really blended some trans, transgender queer issues with Heinlein, with, with Smith, with, with Good Donuts, because you know what? We get to read those books too, and we love them too. Yeah. Maybe I mean, not some of the sexist parts of Heinlein, but you know, in general, we can respect the man uh, as, as an institution. Of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that was, you know, the one of the other reasons. The second reason was more personal in that maybe you didn't go through some of the specifics, but you, don't get to be where you are without going through some rough times. I don't need to, I don't need to even guess. I'm just, I just know. Isn't that something we can share as a people? Isn't that something that should bind us? It's not, shouldn't always be about our wins, but I mean, our, what we've gone through, you know, um, it's not going through an abusive household or go being uh, taking advantage of or worried about where your next meal is coming from or being treated with disrespect. This isn't just a trans issue. I know, but this is this is something that we all share. But I'm at the very best only cautiously optimistic 
with the polarization that I see in my mind, of course, I'm a fatalist anyway, but oh, that's a, yeah, sorry, but you know, I mean, it's just watching things happening every day. I don't see it moving the way you want oh. it to move it, but I admire the fact it's like, I, all right, I'll leave after this. I'm going to leave. I will end because I'm going to start talking too much, but it's like <laughs> the way I feel about the universe. It's just like, you need to move in the way that you're tending towards the right force. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's all you can do really is just, you need to move the correct way so that the universe moves in the correct way as well. And you can't, mm -hmm. and, and the best thing you're doing actually is writing a book. Well, it's what I know how to do. Right. Um, you know, the, and um, as we, as I write and as I, you know, as, as I put these books out, I have been so overjoyed and thrilled by the reactions that some of the advanced readers have, have had. I was just featured in amazing stories, okay? Amazing stories. When we're talking about old school science fiction, it doesn't get more old school than that. And a, you know, the person, the gentleman who selected me was just as white as you were and um you know probably y'all grew up watching the same television shows and i reached him too and i've had uh you know even 20 years ago to be a transgender anything i couldn't get this i couldn't get this sort of wow. uh, not not at all and tor reached out and I found out on tour I'm not the only queer person there there's there's so many writers there that uh, that are doing amazing things and bringing their own bit of the margins back into the fold to just good reading and so um, I think it would be disingenuous of me to be anything other than optimistic for all the generosity and the kindness and the openness and, and just the good old street smarts and goodwill that so many of the readers have given me. It's funny because this would be cancel culture if I was just applying it to you, but I'm applying it to me as well. Mm -hmm. If I got something in fantasy, I would feel like a little schoolgirl. I would be as happy <laughs> as a little schoolgirl. So if I can, <laughs> that's okay, right? I can say that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you must have been just like over the moon. I mean, that's would be my dream. I, I just, okay, thank you. Um, some of my, <laughs> some of the other people didn't understand what this meant because I was like taking, I, these are the magazines that I would steal and put into my parents' shopping cart. Okay. And, and there I was amazing stories. And at that, that's when I, okay. Having this book is really, really nice. But the day I said, you know, I've won this, I, I win, I win. I've, I, I've been where I needed, to, I, I've been to Paris, I'm good, was knowing that somebody at Amazing Stories loved my work. Well, for both of us, I think that's the most amazing thing you've ever done in your life. It's just, it's great. So I'm Absolutely. very- I'm very happy for everything that you've done and everything you're going to do. And I just can't tell you how much I enjoyed doing this, not just doing this and talking to you, but that was incredible, but also just spending the time I have with the book and looking forward to reading it again tonight. Oh, so. You're so welcome. And I just also want to tell you, thank you very, very, very much for uh, all that you do. Independent bookstore owners are are just indispensable and it's often a thankless job and yeah. it's often a job where you know some people nowadays might even think why do we even have independent bookstores when you have amazon and barnes and noble and it's because there are things that you can give all of us that they will never be able to match so i just want to say thank you you're welcome the only thing the thing is if you ever talk to an independent books seller and they say they're making a lot of money they're lying mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's what i mean you have all of the expectations of being a business owner but you're owning a bookstore exactly. and, and and it's really rough work and i recognize that and the fact that you're still so generous with your time and we're speaking like this thank you yeah that's a great part of my life it's the, it's the happiest thing i do mm -hmm. so 
thanks again so much. And you're I really so welcome. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Take good care, everybody. Light from Uncommon Stars, September 28th. Please buy it. You'd make this author very, very happy. Thank you. It'll be on our front table and in the window as well. Awesome. All the best to you. You too. Bye-bye. Take good care. Bye-bye.